Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here for our very first video on the second season of Histoire Source Source Story, a video series for Canadian history teachers where we talk with creators and artists and activists and uh, archivists and historians about one primary or secondary source and we talk about what is the source, what is the story, and how can teaching with it challenge Canadian history. We don't just want you to bring these sources in our classroom and tell the same stories that they can get in a textbook, but rather teach broader, more integrated more inclusive, more decolonizing, more transformative sources in your classroom. And we have such a wonderful season lined up for you. And this video is one, it really, really like um, sets it off in the best path possible. So before I begin, I just want to remind you that we are available on all these social media sites. So make sure you follow us, make sure you subscribe, like this video, click the notification bell, do all those things on YouTube to help us with our algorithms and so that everyone and gets a chance to be able to see us. Um, and also take a look at our website. Each video, long form video, we have a full resource page with different archives and different um, lesson ideas that you can bring into your classroom. We also have an invitation for you to bring in lesson ideas if you have ones after you do this teaching in your classroom. We've also started this thing where we've created um, full playlists for every single video that we do so that you can see not only this video, but conversations around the interwebs related to this. So make sure you check that out. Finally, if you haven't watched our videos before, know that all of our videos are available in both French and English through subtitles. So click closed captioning below and pick English or French subtitles if that is a better way for you to access the information. Finally, because this is an English video, our French host is gonna do a little reaction video. And that is Christine. She's gonna do a little reaction video in French to be able to talk a little bit about the learning that she picked from a francophone perspective from our talks. This talk, as well as all of our English talks, and when she does a video, then I do a little, you know, um, reaction video in English. It's It's been a really, really great way to like bring the bilingualism into this conversation. So we are so excited for this first video because it really sets off the season that we want to have. Our videos from September to June, this really sets off what we want to do in Hiswar Source Source story. We want to talk about primary sources. We want to talk about ways that you can mobilize these primary sources to be able to do new different things in the service of social justice, in the service of reconciliation, in the service of meaningful connections with yourself and your own stories. And I cannot wait to be able to talk with Richard Van Camp, who is, who is who we're going to talk about today. So originally I got in touch with Richard because I wanted to talk about his new book, Gather. It's called Gather on the Joy of Storytelling. And I was like, we tell stories in this video series. What a great way to start start. And he's like, but I got some other stuff that I want to talk about. And I was like, yes, let's do that. So um, Richard have a, has a whole section in this place. And his section is called Like a Razor Slash. And it is based on a 1975 speech that you can find, well, link below, obviously, but you can also find on YouTube through the CBC archives. And it and what he does is that he has really told the backstory of this work and it is so inspiring. And when we talked about this before we started filming, I was like, oh, let's bring all of that. Richard, as a comic book writer, has also wrote books like A Blanket of Butterflies. I don't think we'll get a chance to talk about this quite as much, although you should definitely pick this up. A brand new copy in color, like my copy is black and white, but a brand new copy um, uh, and a trilogy is coming out in color. The other thing is, after I connected with Richard for the very first time, he was like, you need to connect with Scott. Scott is the artist of most of the kind of graphic work that Richard has done recently. And so there's a separate little video where I get to talk with Scott Henderson about his work with Richard Van Camp related to this place and most most uh, specifically, A Blanket of Butterflies. So we're gonna get to ch a chance to talk with Richard in this conversation, mainly about like a razor slash, mainly about how we translate these historical concepts, these indigenous ways of knowing, this Dene history into um, a graphic format, an illustrated format, and how this really has like 
resonance and importance for conversations about reconciliation. So welcome to the series if this is your first video. Welcome back if this is not. Uh, we're, we're so excited for this series. Make sure you like and comment. Make sure you check out our website and enjoy my conversation with Richard. When I got to meet him as we were preparing for this, I was like, He's amazing. I'm so glad that this is our first conversation. And if you don't know, this is Betty. Betty shows up in a lot of videos and uh, sometimes causes trouble. All right, let's go over to Zoom. Richard, thank you so much. I am so excited that you are our very first speaker for this year's um, series of videos. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we begin, please introduce yourself. Donate, Donate, Sagya Masi, my friends, it's Richard Van Camp from Fort Smith Northwest Territories coming to you today from Treaty 6 country. We live in Edmonton, Alberta. My wife is Kiwi Martin. Our little boy is at Zazi and Usulk, Washi Van Camp. And it's a beautiful day and I'm excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk with you. That's such great enthusiasm and like energy to begin this conversation and the whole series. And why I reached out to you at first and why I'm so excited is because we are talking about history. We're talking about interpreting this history. We're talking about talking to youth. We're talking about indigenous ways of knowing, and I'm just so excited. So let's go into it. We have a really great historical source, and then we're going to talk about how you have brought some of these learnings to a more contemporary audience right right hey samantha i gotta tell you before we talk about the youtube link the cbc honoring of frank caselli's beautiful speech in 1976 in fort good hope i want to just back up a little bit and tell you how i stumbled across frank caselli's speech which which changed my life forever and i'm so grateful we were able to honor frank caselli and his family and the community of Fort Good Hope, but what happened was... I was a stay-at-home dad when our little boy, Idzazi, was tiny. And it was just such a wonderful time, a glorious time, a time of long naps. And I was reading Patrick Scott's book one day in our home. I think Idzazi was two. And that must have put me at around 40, I think I was 44, 45 in age. And I remember reading Patrick Scott's book, Talking Tools. And in it, it's a great book, in it was, were excerpts of Frank Tosselli's speech. And my jaw dropped because I was surprised, I was horrified, I was mortified, I was aghast that somebody who was born and raised in Fort Smith, Northwest Territory, somebody who lived the first 18 years of his life in Fort Smith, I was so surprised and saddened that I didn't know that one of the greatest speeches of all time, right up there with Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, one of the greatest speeches of all time was delivered in Fort Good Hope in 1976. I would, would have been five years old by the great Frank Tosselli, who was the chief of Fort Good Hope at the time. And his speech happened and was recorded by CBC. And thank goodness CBC uploaded it to YouTube because if that ever comes down, the world is not going to know about this speech. And that was the fear that motivated me to when when Portage and Main called and said, you know, would you like to tell a part of Canadian history from the Indigenous point of view from the Western NWT, Denende? Is there, is there a chapter in Denende's history 
that you're so worried the world is never going to know about. And I knew in, in that phone call, absolutely. I said, I not only do I know uh, Bella Tasselli, Frank's wife, uh, I could probably get his phone number. And why don't I work closely with Mr. Tasselli over the next two years with artist Scott Henderson? And, and let's really start to understand what went into the crafting of such a beautiful speech. And I'm so grateful to CBC for recording it, uploading it, you know, keeping it up on YouTube. And I'm so grateful to High Water Press. I'm so grateful to my publisher, Laura McKay. I'm so grateful to Scott Henderson. And at most of all, I'm really I'm indebted to Frank Tuscelli for putting up with us because we would call him, we would email him. It was, it was over two years of working with him. And what I want people to walk away with was the, the key question was answered over a phone call. And I said, Frank, you were 28 years old. You were speaking to Judge Thomas Berger during the Berger inquiry. You had executives from, I think, Imperial Oil. You had major players in the room with you, along with other Dene and, and CBC. I think you told me, Frank, you only had three days to write the speech. I think they were given three days notice that, that Judge Thomas Berger was coming. How did you write one of the greatest speeches of our time for all time in three days? And he said, well, Richard, I had three days to write it, but I had 28 years of listening behind me. I was, I was raised in, in, in the band council meetings. I was raised, you know, to listen to my elders, my ancestors, my parents. So he says, I was guided by many hands in that speech. And I just think it's so timeless. And, and I really do feel that his words, that speech should be on posters in classrooms right across this country, because it really cements everything you ever hear about Indigenous people and their relationship and their unity and their partnership with the land. And, and I'm in awe. I'm so grateful that we were able to work with Frank and, uh, and honor him the way that we did. Um, and I'm really grateful for the patience of High Water Press because it took longer than we ever expected to not only work on my chapter with Scott and Mr. Ticelli, but also all the other um, artist teams and writing teams and researchers. So I'm, I'm in awe of this place, 150 years retold. I'm so grateful. Um, I'd love to work on another, you know, if they ever decide to do it again, I'd count me in because I learned so much from it. And I think that's one of the reasons I write, Samantha, is I'm so worried that the world is, isn't going to know how amazing we are. I'm so worried that our traditions, our customs, or the customs of other Dene nations within Dene Day, I just want the world to know how magnificent we are, and how strong we are, and how romantic we are, and how beautiful and resilient and just fun. You know what I mean? And and this was one of the highest honors in my entire career. This was one of my highest honors. It was a privilege and I'm really proud of it. And uh, thank you for showcasing it because I really want Canadian students, you know, right across this great country of ours to, to open up this book and to not only read the comic, but go and watch the presentation on YouTube because the camera people were so smart because they not only filmed Frank Tasselli at 28 and Fort Good Hope giving this incredible speech, you can see the growing horror on the faces of the oil executives because they realized that this was not going to happen. That that this, the, the Denny in 1976, and to this day, know who they are, know where they're from, know what's important. And they were dealing with a visionary and they were dealing with somebody who who would not be manipulated by jobs, 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 and fast cash, that this was somebody who was thinking seven generations ahead. And I'm really grateful. I'm, I'm in awe. So, so I, I'm really glad that in this day of illustrated literature and multimedia, that it, it's, it's in partnership. So definitely read the comics so you can understand what got Frank to the table, what guided him that day, you know, him surviving residential schools, et cetera, et cetera. But Definitely watch the video and you'll see it's a dance of horror on the faces of anyone who thought that they could come up, throw some money around and get exactly what they wanted. Because I really do believe Frank, one of, you know, and there were hundreds of speeches that, that took place. Frank's was certainly one of them that I really do believe put the caveat on, on hitting the pause button on the Mackenzie Valley pipeline. 
I'm in awe. I will always be in awe of Frank DeSelli. Yes. Thank you so much for all of that. And we're not going to watch the whole speech, but I think that, I mean, I'm going to quickly screen share because like you said, it is so accessible on YouTube because of, because they recorded it in the CBC and we'll make sure that we have the links and everything attached to this video. Um, we also do specially curated um, playlists. And so people will be able to definitely be able to access it. But what we're really what we really want to highlight too is like the contents of the speech and the ways that you brought this as a story in a graphic novel format because it helps bring that legacy of that power so strongly to a modern audience of youth perhaps who are reading graphic novels or comic books. Um, and so I'm just so excited about this kind of blend of this history, the activism, um, it, like really understanding indigenous land, like connection to land in this very contemporary media of, of illustration. Mm, Masi Cho, thank you. Hey, so in the YouTube clip, it says 1975 that the speech happened. So I apologize if I've been saying 1976, that's my fault. Um, just know that I, I think we did the math. I think I was five years old in Fort Smith Northwest Territories when uh, Frank Tasselli gave that talk. I believe it was August 26, 19, well, it looks like it's 1975. I've been saying 1976 during this interview. I apologize. I think actually yeah. what's interesting about if you were wrong about the date or if the video is wrong is that it is your connection, it's your recollection to like you and the date that you remembered. And I actually think that's such an important thing in just like history education generally, like sometimes it isn't the like exact date and the exact facts and mm. it's the exact, exact name, but it is the way that we are interpreting it and understanding it. And sometimes that is a way that really helps us understand a bigger version of ourselves or a version of ourselves in a bigger way. And sometimes it can be very narrow as well. And I think here mm -hmm. is a really good example, like you are placing yourself in that speech by, by the year, right? And so again, we will provide the right year if you're right or That's you're right. right. But at the same time, I don't think it matters as much as really demonstrating it is like you are you are linking it to you being five years old and the fact that you didn't know about it for so long in your life. Nope. So why don't we take a little bit of a look at the artwork and you can talk maybe a little bit about the process of putting it all together as a way to like ha make this story into a story that we can um, see and read and, and like appreciate the artwork on the page. Sound good? Sounds great. Okay, I just wanted to really quickly screen share this place in particular, your section like a razor slash, which talks about the the Mackenzie Valley pipeline and Frank's speech, but not just the speech, but also all of the like different historical elements that got him to the place. Like I've been planning this speech for so many years. How you know, like the historical context to get him to have that speech and and then, like you said, you know, the different ways to pull up the history, but also the reactions in the past and present. And it's just so great. And I can really see why you'd want to ensure that you were working really closely with him to be able to tell this story. Um, yeah. And I also want to highlight for teachers that this place has a full teacher's guide. There's a couple versions, actually, I think. So if they are interested in teaching with this, but want some supports to, to go and get that teacher guide. I'm interested how you thought of or came to comic books as a medium to tell the stories that you want to tell, especially when they are historical based. Well, you know, I, w my family moved to Calgary in grade two and my parents went back to the University of Calgary to get their degrees. And I was in grade two, we enrolled in Sunnyside uh, Elementary in Calgary, ne right next to Hot Wax Records. I remember that. We were at the base of Nose Hill and it was just this beautiful summer. I think the teachers were on strike. I, I seem to remember that it would just, it felt like 18 years before school actually began, which was even better than anything I could have ever imagined. But basically, as soon as we moved to, to Calgary, my appendix exploded inside my, my stomach. 
and I, I actually was not supposed to make it. It I one of my lungs collapsed and I my blood turned septic, and I ended, ended up in the Calgary Children's Hospital for quite some time in an oxygen tent. I remember coming to in an oxygen tent and and I had this tube hanging out of my stomach and and uh, I just remember a how how scared my parents were, and b I just made these two friends, Chris and Toby. I can't remember their names, their last names. And they ended up showing up in their suits and all their comic books. And they were like, we're, we're so sorry, Richard, you know, Oh, Hey man. Hey, it's just, it was so nice knowing you. I'm like, what do you mean? And like, Oh, they, they didn't tell you like, you're not going to make it. You're going to die. And I was like, what, what? And I'm in my little oxygen tent. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean I'm going to die? I'm only in grade two. Right. And I don't want to die. And they're like, listen, you can have all our comic books, okay? Because we just read about the pharaohs. And and you get them on the other side. You get them here, but you get them on the other side too. And I was like, what other side? Anyways, that's all true. And one of the comics that was in that pile next to Sergeant Rock and the Unknown Soldier and Archie was The Warlord by Mike Grell, issue 13. And that comic book won my heart. And every day, I must have read that comic five times a day. I mean, I had a lot of time. Like all convicts, I had a lot of time. So I would read it with these little dolphin flaps for my arms so I could hug my, my parents and my brother. Uh, but I, you know, when they make a movie about my life, there's going to be the Warlord issue 13 and me trying to turn the pages with my little dolphin arms to this oxygen tent with, one, with my collapsed lung. And uh, I made a deal with myself that A, I wasn't going to die. And B, I would get the first 12 issues as soon as I got out. I had a I had a mission, right? A, don't die. B, get every copy of The Warlord by Mike Grell. And when I was strong enough and I was released and I had these little crutches, I went down to Sunnyside Confectionery and I ended up going up to the comic book rack and, and looking. And I went to the counter with my little brother. I said, excuse me, do you have the first 12 issues of Mike Grell's The Warlord? And he was like... No, he goes, it's up to, I mean, I think the new issue is 72. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, the issue, it's, yeah, I think we just put out 72. We're sold out. Do you want me to set 73? I think it comes out in a month. And I was like, yes. And so my, my mission in life, A, was to still not die, but B, get all 70 plus issues of the warlord and luckily calgary's got a great comic book scene so it took me years to get every copy of the warlord issue 13 actually i have some of the original art this is what a fanatic so to answer your question i've been collecting comic books for i'm 50 years old that's amazing so this is this is mike grell's original artwork for the page that just won my heart i tracked it down so I've been collecting comic books for 47 years. No, no, maybe 43. I can't remember. 43 years. I you mean, know, I don't the, the... like the way that it looks quite similar to this is I know. <laughs> amazing. So, so to answer your question, I've been collecting comics for, let's say, let's just say 43 years. And I've got a bunch of long boxes and I've got stacks of comic books and graphic novels and illustrated literature. And I loved Savage Sword of Conan growing up and, and several other titles. And somewhere along the way, after my first novel came out, The Lesser Blessed in 1996, and then working with George Littlechild on A Man Called Raven and What's the Most Beautiful Thing You Know About Horses, I got to meet an artist named Steve Sanderson in Vancouver. He's Cree, and he is absolutely incredible. And I started off as his editor for a company then called the Healthy Aboriginal Network. And to work with Steve Sanderson and to see that when he came to the table with an idea for a comic, it was basically done. Steve Sanderson lives and breathes comic books and he is a genius. He is an absolute genius. And not only does he you know, write, illustrate, color, he also does the um, voice work for the animatics that we were working on. And then one day the publisher, Sean Muir asked me, well, I mean, you've edited enough of Steve's comics you must have a couple of ideas yourself and and we were able to work on two comic books together one was path of the warrior which was about gang uh, violence prevention and i got to work with steve on that one and we we're really proud we gave away twenty thousand comics away for free across british columbia and that's really where i saw how comics it would be hard to give away twenty thousand copies of a book 
I, I can't explain it, but 20,000 comic books that deal with something as hard hitting as gang violence prevention. Um, but you, you use the word humanity. It, it's a, it's a tearjerker because it is such a human book. And then after we came out with Path of the Warrior, Sean said, do you want to work on anything else? I said, actually, yeah. I said, you know, we had the worst sexual health talk at PWK High in grade eight. And I would love to write a comic book about what I wish I could have heard when I was in grade eight. And, and he said, great. And Steve was book solid in, in those days. And he still is to this day working for, you know, various series on Netflix. I think his latest series are that he's worked on our The Last Kids on Earth which is huge. And we couldn't get Steve. And uh, I had seen uh, Christopher Octor illustrating Jordan Wheeler's books, his Chuck in the City series. And I loved how zany and wild and fun Chris Octor's artwork is. And he's Haida. And I got in touch with Christopher. I tracked him down and I said, how'd you like to illustrate a comic book on sexual health? And I remember his email was like, I'd love to. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go, go, go. He, it was just the energy was fantastic and we ended up working together and I really do feel that if you're going to be teaching about sexual health and sensuality you need zany and you need funny and you need humor and we were able to give away 10,000 copies across the Northwest Territories and I again so what I realized along the way was that comic books a as much as I love reading them they're also a lot of fun writing because Again, the things that I'm worried about with the world forgetting about the Northwest Territories or not knowing about the Northwest Territories, about our traditions, our cultures, our teachings, our way in the world, comic books are the perfect way to really celebrate that knowledge because in A Blanket of Butterflies, we have our, our 10 Dene laws because so many young people don't know that we have Dene laws that we're supposed to follow every day. Number one being share what you have. It's the greatest law in the whole wide world, share what you have. So I wanted comic books and graphic novels and the illustrated literature that I'm working on to be a welcoming place into our own culture. And in A Blanket of Butterflies, I was also able to honor Aya, who was the Delaney prophet who passed away in 1940. And once again, I thought to myself, I wonder how many people are going to know that there was a prophet from Delaney who foresaw the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and Aya passed in 1940, several years before the detonation. And he spent his life warning people that there's going to be a time when white people and Dene people work together to take black eggs out of the earth and put them into birds so powerful they never have to flap their wings. And Aya, even as a young man, saw these two birds flying to where the sun goes at night. And it dropped two, these birds dropped two eggs on people who looked just like us, Dene people. And there was a fire so bright, he said, it, le it left only their shadows on what was left of their homes. And when George Blondin shared that with us, I was studying land claims in 1991 in Yellowknife. I was taking a course called Native Management Studies. And when he shared that with us, there was that once again cultural aha. Why in my 20s am I only learning about Aya now? And why in my 40s, thank you, Patrick Scott, for your book, Talking Duels. Why is it in my 40s, as a brand new father, am I only learning about Frank Tosselli's speech now? And, and that has been the, the alchemy of my life where that shock and outrage and, and sadness turns into empowerment where I say, well, if I didn't know it, what if I put it in a comic book or in a short story or in a children's book with permission, that way future generations have it forever. And, and you know, most importantly, our little boy at Zazi, who's eight, will have these forever now so that it Zazi knows daddy broke trail with some of the greats, Frank Tosselli, George Blondin, to be able to work with these titans you know, these cultural heroes, this makes me so proud. Thank you so much for all of that, that kind of the rich layering of all of those different elements and how it leads to the work that we're talking about today. I know that we don't have a lot more time to keep talking about this, although I feel like we could talk forever. Just as a way maybe to wrap up our conversation, 
The third question we'd like to ask in the series is, how does this challenge Canadian history? And I think that the this here is so many different elements from what you've been talking about today. Um, Dene knowledge, Northwest territories, the, the Dene laws, comic books. Is there any kind of final takeaway about challenging Canadian history um, that you want maybe teachers to be able to hear when they are introducing this work to their students? Oh, wow. Uh, that's the million dollar question. But I yeah. do feel, Samantha, that the, the gift of reconciliation, the spirit of reconciliation is about showing up, speaking up, stepping up, and really listening with an open heart and an open mind about whose territory you're on, whose territory you're on. And I'll tell you a little story. So I'm from Treaty 8 country. We live in Treaty 6 country. And in the spirit of reconciliation, because I am a guest here, my, my family is a guest here, we like to help out in ceremony. And for the past several years, I've been very lucky to be asked to be the doorman at a, at a, at a, at a really profound sweat uh, that takes place out in Enoch. And I think it was two years ago, uh, I was the doorman at this beautiful sweat lodge ceremony, helping out. And I noticed that everybody that was in the lodge was indigenous, but everyone who was helping, everyone who was setting up the chairs and the tarps and spreading the blankets and helping out with the, the kitchen and the cooking and everyone who was helping was not indigenous. And I looked around and I thought, this is reconciliation. We need allies to help us return to our wholeness. And even somebody like myself who is indigenous, I have a debt, I have an obligation to this paradise that we live in in Treaty 6. So I too always wanna help out. So I learn more about the territory and the people and the cultures that, that are here. And, and I would just ask you to anyone watching, ask yourself, what can I do? to step up or speak up? What can I do to help the people here respectfully and, and humbly return to themselves in wholeness and in a good way? And, and, and doing it gently and observing protocol, uh, getting permission for, for what you're wanting. Um, expect to be challenged so that one day when you're presenting on something or time we publish a book, if anybody says, who gave you the right to tell this particular story? I always feel so proud knowing, and th that day certainly is coming. I always feel so proud saying, well, actually, I did work with Frank for two years. You know, Scott and I did everything we possibly could. Um, we sent gifts, we sent funds. Um, we, we did everything because we only wanted to honor him. That, that is really the spirit of what we went forward with and we did it together and I think that Frank would be able to say you know Richard and Scott Henderson and Highwater Press for over two years mailed me everything I signed off there wasn't there were no surprises this is exactly how I wanted the world to know about the speech that Richard thinks is just as good as Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream. And I really do. I really do. I'm really, really proud of Frank DeSelli and George Blonde. And I'm so proud to, to have worked with them. And I look forward to honoring more of our Northern heroes. And I think Canadian history, you know, I think a lot of policymakers, I think a lot of Canadian leaders are counting on Indigenous people to have a short memory. And our strength is our oral tradition. Our strength is we know who we are, we know where we're from, we have our side of, of what happened. And I would encourage Canadians to ask, what's your version of what happened? And I think you'd be pleasantly surprised every single time. And, and that really is the spirit of reconciliation is showing up, listening and, and asking, what, what do you want me to know about your community, your culture, your people, how can I help? That's a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you. That 
I mean, that's a great place to start, but it's also such a powerful way to end this conversation. And a lot of times when I'm talking to teachers about teaching residential schools, for example, like, yes, you can say that like that is one of the calls to action. So it's in the curriculum now, but what are you going to do? What is that next step? How are you teaching your students about their responsibilities now for having this knowledge and, and understanding? And it isn't just about residential schools. It is about a much, much longer colonial history and a colonial present. And I think that the ways that you have talked today, but the ways that the work that we've been talking about have been able to to demonstrate and to honor all of these histories, I think that that is such a powerful way that teachers can bring this into their classroom and hopefully think about those kind of next steps to about what are you going to do in the spirit of reconciliation. So thank you so much, Richard. Thank you for starting our series this year. Thank you for having these conversations with me, talking about comic books, sharing these stories. It's just been so wonderful. So thank you so much. Masi Cho, thank you for having me. All the best, everybody. Take it easy. Have fun. Masi Cho. 